Welcome to the course Culturally Responsive Built Environments. Today we are going to discuss about religious architecture, a continuum of meaning. So basically as we have discussed the how power has played an important role in shaping uh, the built environment starting from a building to a much more uh, urban level. So uh, here we are actually bringing about a particular contribution and in relation uh, in parallel with it we are also discussing about various uh, both the Asian cases and the Mexican cases and the North African cases. So, so that we get an idea of uh, how religion is one of the important factor of determining the built forms and it's uh, the way it is function and the way it has been negotiated and how it actually integrates and as well as segregates aspects. So one of the important contribution which I want to bring to your notice is Dora Crouch and uh, June Johnson's work on traditions in architecture which covers a very vast region of Africa and America and Asia and in the Oceania. So in which I am talking about, I am on a particular chapter, the seventh chapter of uh, religious architecture, a continuum of meaning. So how meanings are associated through religion and how religion as a uh, catalyst, how it negotiates with the built form. The, he discuss, I mean the, the others discusses about uh, three aspects. Uh, one is in the space in the home and the second in the space in the streets and the third one the spaces that set apart. So we will start with the very interior aspect of a home and how, how it is negotiated and how it gets transformed. So in the Japanese culture we have the very basic fundamental aspect of in any Japanese home is the tokonoma in, in shortly called as toko. So this is a kind of what you see here is a kind of uh, image of uh, Japanese tokonoma which is a well defined uh, uh, small uh, recession space. Uh, so initially it was actually uh, historically it has a significance from almost uh, centuries ago but then uh, this is a kind of uh, a sacred space. So what you see here is uh, this is a, a simple element which has a kind of uh, enclosure with a kind of timber post and a raised platform and uh, sometimes a kind of calligraphy or any particular uh, small elements of tree or any uh, plants would have been placed. So this has been um, considered when sitting there, you know, uh, when guests come to your home in a Japanese style room. So the very correct custom is to seat the most important guest with his or her back facing the tokonoma. It's because this is because of the modesty. The host should not be seen to show off the contents of tokonoma to the guest. So the, the guest normally comes and turns his back so that and thus it is necessary not to point the guest towards the tokonoma. So the way this particular aspect also uh, takes into kind of it's strictly forbidden you're not allowed to sit on that or you accept during the change of display if they are changing any kind of calligraphy background or any kind of flower aspect of it and when a strict uh, adequate protocol must be followed so and the space allocated for the tokonoma can vary and usually does not occupy the full expanse of the wall. So what you see here is, so the other side of is kind of you have uh, tokowaki, so which is basically it is separated by a thin fixed partition and columns is an alcove for shelves or cabinets. So you have the shelves and the little displays of some kind of uh, either a religious aspect of it or a kind of ornamental aspect of it. So that is called tokowaki. And the column between the two recesses, so the, though uh, the both the recesses are there, that is called tokobashira, and is the same size and square shape, sometimes regular, uh, as a structural post. So what you see here is here, 
if you see it is raised, the tokowaki and this one comparatively this is raised. And you also get a kind of sunlight and everything onto this. So because they are the symbolically, they are not symmetrical, they are asymmetrical because it comes back from the kind of Gen philosophy of which urges to be the asymmetrical aspect of it. And uh, they try to place the tokonoma in uh, the higher position of it. So symbolically it depicts the sacredness of it. And but now what is happening in the present day time because it is almost a kind of sacred even the Frank Lloyd Wright during his visits to Japan and how he have translated this understanding of the traditional aspect of tokonoma in his um, the modern uh, concepts in way back in American culture. So how the modernization understanding of this traditional how they have taken these ideas and how they developed these traditional ideas and uh, how they fit in the modern context is also very interesting. So here in fact if you reflect, if you go back to the Buddhist temples, even there you can see these kind of posts, the Tokobashira's post, which is very symbolically reflecting to the emperor, uh, the uh, emperor of that particular age or time. But now, and even having a sacred tea, because tea is something which is sacred in the kind of uh, uh, Japanese culture, and how they have tea together and uh, especially um, in the noble uh, classes uh, how they perform these tea rituals in front of the tokonoma and uh, at the same time in the modern times what happens is now that religious aspect has gradually uh, started coming down and uh, in many at in many at cases, you know, it becomes more of a kind of aesthetic. So, from religious aspect to the transformation is more towards the aesthetic aspect. Still, in many cases, they do follow certain religious, but the tendency of becoming more aesthetic sometimes how it is borrowed from other cultures and how it is become more aesthetic rather than the religious aspect is uh, interesting. And uh, similarly. If we talk about the indigenous festivity dedicated to the dead of Mexico, so uh, we talk about a small room, Tokonoma in Japan, and now we are coming to the, the festivity which is celebrated from home to the streets. So the journey we are taking from a home to the uh, streets and the cemeteries. So in fact, this particular festivity, uh, uh, we call it as a kind of uh, altar of dead. And uh, this is also listed under the uh, UNESCO intangible heritage. So, what they do is it's a kind of it's a kind of, it's a day. Uh, I mean, it's a, almost uh, starts about end of October towards the November second, third. Uh, so there will a lot of preparation before that before the festivity starts. So it's a kind of uh, how the Mexicans, how it comes from uh, the Aztecs time, how they believe that you know the people who are dead and they have the power to bring the prosperity back and at the same time. So for that you need to welcome them back and how you treat them and how you, so that that kind, of, that kind of a becomes a tradition, how it transfers from one generation to another generation. So the myths of the ancestors and how they carry over to one generation to another generation and the belief system, how they welcome to the, pros uh, the prosperity from the dead. So in fact, uh, there is a small uh, video here. <laughs> Dios te salve María, llena eres de gracia, Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres y bendita tú eres. As practiced by the indigenous communities of Mexico, the Día de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, commemorates the transitory return to earth of deceased relatives and loved ones. Festivities take place each year at the end of October and at the beginning of November. This period also marks the completion of the annual cycle of maize, the country's predominant food crop.
Families facilitate the return of souls to earth by laying flower petals, candles and offerings along the path leading from the cemetery to their homes. The deceased's favourite dishes are carefully prepared and placed around the home shrine and the tomb, alongside flowers and typical handicrafts such as paper cutouts. Great care is taken with all aspects of the preparations, for it is believed that the dead are capable of bringing prosperity such as an abundant maize harvest, or misfortune, such as illness, accidents or financial difficulties, upon their families, depending on how satisfactorily the rituals are executed. The dead are divided into several categories, according to cause of death, age, sex, and in some cases professional activity. A specific day of worship, determined by these categories, is designated for each deceased person. The Day of the Dead celebration has great spiritual and artistic richness, and is of considerable significance in the daily life of the indigenous communities, bringing a philosophical dimension to both life and death. This fusion of pre-Hispanic religious rites and Catholic feasts brings together two distinct universes and allows cultural syncretism between indigenous thinking and the ideological system imported by the Europeans in the 16th century. The annual encounter between the indigenous people and their ancestors fulfills a social function by affirming the role of the individual within society. It also contributes to reinforcing the political and social status of Mexico's indigenous communities who strive to preserve their cultural diversity. So the festivities takes place around the end of October and to the beginning of November, uh, second or third. And uh, this period, uh, why they celebrate this period is also it's the beginning of, it's the completion of annual cycle of cultivation of mage, which is a country's predominant crop. So uh, the families facilitate the return of the souls uh, to earth by laying flower petals, especially the yellow marigold, uh, so, and then putting the candles and offerings along the path leading from the cemetery to their homes. So they cook their uh, favorite dishes and, here, and they decorate their tombs and things like that. So this is how they take a very great care because the belief system is that if you take a great care, that much prosperity you get. Otherwise, it might bring a misfortune. So that's how uh, this kind of belief system have established a tradition so that the whole narratives and the performatives of this ancestral uh, traditions have been uh, conducted. And uh, they have also divided into several categories according to the cause of the death, if it is by accident or a natural death, or age, if it's a small child or elder person, the sex is a male or female, and in some cases by a profession, if it's a doctor or if it's uh, anyone. Uh, so a specific day of worship is also determined by these categories and is designated for each deceased person. So, if you look at a similar culture, it is still existent even in Indian cultures, many of, in, in, in fact, in my, from my hometown, where on the Pongal day, we all go to our uh, the burial grounds and we decorate our uh, ancestor places where they were buried and we clean that and we share, put their uh, food, uh, what they liked, and then we share that food and then we, uh, that is the only point where we meet all our cousins and all other extended families. In fact, uh, this is an occasion where we are able to meet all the extended families and share with us both the joy and uh, invite the prosperity. So now in the present, and they also decorate with a kind of sugar, can sugar candies, so making a skull models and things like that. So now 
With this, uh, the Katrina models of in the Mexican folk culture, so if you look at it, so these are the much more of the modern versions. And different places are celebrated in different ways. Like if you take in California, San Francisco, the Americanization, so how it has been modernized. And in fact, now it is like the way they celebrate the Halloween. The original way it was celebrated in Halloween in European context was completely very different what and the myths and the stories which were transferred was in a different way. Now students wear in a different dress and they play with these skulls and all these things. But the whole idea has been changed. So that is where we see when these kind of festivities how the commercialization aspect, the cultural brings the cultural economies. So that is what uh, one of the important aspects, the growing commercialization of the celebration threatens its domestic feast with the loss of much religious meaning. Today, how many of the youngsters know the religious meaning into it? So that is the threat, you know, because of the, um, the way we are celebrating, the way the things were happening. So it is actually diluting the religious meaning. So the second aspect, we come to the space in the street. So one good example uh, the authors cover is uh, Bhaktapur in Nepal, which is, I mean, the photograph which you see is before the earthquake, because in the, after the 2015 earthquake, the whole of the complexes has got demolished. So, if you, the whole procession, especially the Bhaktapur, this whole square, is one of the important places for urban design study and how various religious shrines were established starting from Ganesha, Shiva, Vishnu, uh, Badrakali. Uh, so how these are all come together in a kind of uh, an amalgamation of these shrines and how they develop a meaning uh, to that particular place. And uh, not only the meaning, it is also how people associate the way these particular wide streets and the plazas are conducted. For instance, you have the, the upper part of the, so the procession moves from the upper part to the lower part and which is about the older center of Takapal upper right and the newer center of Taumadi and uh, that is how the procession takes place and there are various uh, uh, almost seven shrines of Ganesh, Vishnu and uh, mother goddesses three shrines of mother goddesses and you have the dancing platforms and the three fountains and the small shops. So this whole, uh, it's a very lively atmosphere and it normally, as mm, the quote says, the realm of gods, the streets and plazas are open to all caste and all followers of the various Hindu gods, the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas and the Aboriginal nature nature gods. So, because in that particular religious uh, place, it is not only the Hindu gods, there is also the Buddhist philosophy into it, the Bodhisattvas and also some traditional ab aboriginal nature gods. So, but this processions, you know, the street opens to everyone and everyone can able to come and participate. So, this openness is different from enclosed shrines and monasteries that welcome their own, like in, if it is a monastery or shrine, it is actually controlling the movement of who wants to go inside. It is their own, it welcomes only their own uh, people. And mainly the people only prefer to go there, but the street, it's a venue for everyone, everything to happen. And it is also the festival, which actually lasts for about eight to nine days. And it is both has a historical and cultural significance. It is actually uh, talks about the wedding procession of God Bhairav and Goddess Badrakali. So similarly, if you the the way the whole procession goes down to the riverside, and that is where you see the Smashan Ghat. You know, the, that is where the lower gods, where they have the uh, in the Smashan Ghat we have the shrines, or uh, minor gods, gods of death like Emma or the, uh, other bad gods or demons. So, which means, so the hierarchy of uh, the religion also plays with the way how it is performed, you know. Uh, so, the richer, the allied gods of the Vishnu and they're all in the higher position where this whole thing is celebrated. But the whole procession takes on to the, the bank of the river where the death you know, happens. So, between these two groups, because obviously there are different caste and groups, social groups within it. 
and uh, the one street of the city that is wide enough for vehicles. So that is the main street and that is this road 300 meter long and is also the way of the dead. So uh, whoever is dead, so basically they are brought from different streets to the main street and then along to the main street down to the river. So that is where they are, the dead are burnt and the, at three special places um, called burning guards always look in banks of river and where two rivers join. And this is where uh, this lower plaza is one of the old because everyone unites at the death. So that is important uh, meaning of because how much when we are born at different castes, different religions, but at the end we all unite at the death. So there's always a lot of contradictions even on how we can unite these symmetrical symmetries and the burial grounds. In fact, uh, there is a small uh, video here. So the next one which I talked with our own um, project which we worked with our students in transforming temple streets in Sri Rangam. So Sri Rangam is, uh, is one of the uh, small island, it is a part of the uh, city of Tilchurapalli in South India. And this has laid out in a kind of uh, cosmic principles of uh, seven concentric circles out of which the four are the main core and uh, this is basically included seven concentric enclosures. The center one is of the Sri Ranganadha Swami and then you have the, all the fortifications follow upon. So each layer has walls and gopurams which were built or fortified. Uh, so it starts actually from 13th to 16th century, 17th century and um, they are all about these walls a total stretch about 9,000, about 10,000 meter round and over 6 miles 
and it has major gopurams of 17 major gopurams and 50 shrines and 9 sacred water pools. On the west side they have a big water pond. So uh, this is oriented towards the north-south and east-west axis on the island surrounded by the Kaveri river. So uh, these five inner courtyards have shrines to Vishnu and his incarnations of various avatars such as Rama and Krishna and additionally they have the goddesses temples and um, these shrines you know they celebrate the bhakti movement which is the poet saints called alvars as well as of hindu philosophers such as ramanuja and vedanta desika it, actually the whole place is a symbolic in, uh, uh, ideology which actually depicts the symbolic aspects of the vaishnavism traditions so in traditions you know like uh, you have you, uh, if one experienced that place uh, many years before, you could see the whole Brahmins located in the first ring and then uh, the goldsmiths and then the blacksmiths, you know, it keeps the, based on the occupation, occupations. So the whole profiles, in fact, our students have documented the whole street lay, uh, layout and how each segment is divided by and varied by its built character and built form. So. But today, what you see is the whole city have expanded on the southern Sri Rangam, which is completely out of the concentric rectangles. And here also, the street becomes a unifying factor. And uh, there are priests, merchants, brass makers, potters, and other social groups who come along. And this is how uh, the, the Thai Kar festival, which was uh, conducted, and in the Uttarai and Chitrai streets, that is where the chariot festival goes around and many of the devotees come along and they celebrate these particular festivals. And similarly, when I talk about chariot festivals in Nepal also, when we talked about these, the chariot festivals, what they do is uh, different social groups come together. And, uh, in fact, uh, some of the literature talks about that there are different gods they follow different troops at some point they meet and they clash each other and some of the literature and many videos which they talk about is how they pull the chariot to different groups on either sides and whoever pulls more to their side that is where the god is favoring them so that's how a kind of religious beliefs which they have and that is where of course many accidents do happen in this kind of uh, situations and similarly, you have these kind of chariot festivals, and uh, that is actually I mean, because of these, the whole profile of the built form is oriented in such a way that they have the projected balconies on the terraces so that they can see, the, the households can watch and see these chariot festivals and these processions along. But gradually, what is happening is such a religious place has gradually turning into, because houses, the traditional forms have expanded both ways, the vertically and horizontally, and the commercial agent as aspect have increased. But today, if one looks at these places, many of the uniform and standardized systems came, like for instance, uh, a mobile recharge shop, which, which is same from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. It has the same fabric, uh, same outlet of that. So uh, the whole meaning of the whole house friends have changed, have come to a new meaning. That is where the tourism based meaning, so it is producing not on a religious based meaning, but it is more dominant by the tourism based. So the, these brass makers are hardly you see nowadays, and but mostly you see all these people selling the toys, Chinese products or any mobile recharge equipment. That is how the whole streets are transforming. So that is one thing which one has to look at how we have a control of this land use and the functionality of these spaces which can still maintain the religious character. Now we talk about the spaces set apart. So some of these spaces were set apart of everyday life and dedicated to religious use. So they are categorized in three categories. One distinguished by its distinctive architectural form and one by the enormous scale and monumental structures that are distinguished from the surrounding built area, and the one by its iconic 
but immense natural form like we talk about the mountains, Mount Taylor or any of the volcanic mountains which has a cultural and religious significance into it. So some good examples of this are kind of great mosque in Kairuan in Tunisia. So it was founded in about 16, 670 and under the Aglabid dynasty in the 9th century and the, despite the transfer of political capital in Tunisia in 12th century. So the Kairuan remained uh, the Maghreb's principal holy city. Its rich architectural heritage includes the great mosque of Kairuan with its marble and prophetic columns and uh, so it has a cemetery at the back and so uh, if you look at the open court onto this on this tower so the view uh, looks like this and it the wall includes a spatial courtyard with arcaded porticos allowing a generous preparation area for prayer and for accommodating enormous crowds for important holidays and if you look at the plan, in fact, there are three types of mosques which we normally find. It's one is a courtyard type, like we have a kind of Tajul Masjid, which is a kind of courtyard model. And the transept type or a central aisle type, you have the central aisle type. And the type with a large domed interior spell, like a blue mosque, which has a large dome. So symbolically, these domes represent the vault of a heaven, a cosmological reference known also in the Romano-Byzantine cultures that preceded Islam because if you want to understand what the architecture in today's Turkey and the Northern Africa, that is where you have to go back to the Roman times as well and the Byzantine period. So they're all various uh, 17 ales and uh, which and the central one is a little wider and if you look at it and there are two domes on here, two domes and there's a central ale and they have about 17 uh, ales and all of a sudden then they have a whole court into it. So this is a kind of dominance. Then second uh, case we are discussing about the pre-Hispanic city of Chichoikian. And this is one of the, the place, uh, you know, this is still, uh, this is also uh, listed in the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So it is about 50 kilometers from northeast of Mexico City. So built in 1st and 7th centuries AD. And the size of the cities and its monuments, especially the temple of Quetzalcoatl and the pyramids of sun and moon, uh, which are laid out in a geometric, in those days they have laid out in a geometric proportions and uh, how the symbolic principles have played an important role. So what you see here is a small, uh, the whole layout is how they are orienting and um, again, uh, the city's urban plan integrated the natural elements of the valley, such as San Juan River, whose course was altered to cross the avenue of the dead. And the north-south oriented main reference axis of the city is lined with monumental buildings and complexes from which the pyramids of sun and moon, as well as a great compound. So if you see how this compound and how this axis is oriented and how this, uh, so the whole city talks about the civic and the religious architecture, which is of our Talud Tablo. And that is where the culture and the belief system, how it actually frames the whole city layout of it and how different orientations and talks about the life and death of it. And, and in those days, this is a city which is considered the model of urbanization and large scale planning. And small video here, you can just watch the film. The City of Gods, the pre-Hispanic city of Teotihuacan. The history of Teotihuacan is believed to go back to the second century BC. It developed into a large city and a center of ancient Mexican culture. However, it was abandoned during the middle of the seventh century. The ruins were later found by Aztec people advancing onto the Mexican Central Plain during the 14th century. The Aztecs believed that it was a sacred place where the sun and moon was created and they named the site Teotihuacan, which means the place of gods. This temple enshrines Quetzalcoatl, the most important god in Central America. Quetzalcoatl means the feathered serpent 
Its shape resembles the flow of a meandering river. Quetzalcoatl was worshipped as the god of life and rich harvest. This temple also enshrines the main god of Teotihuacan. It is Tulaloc, the god of water. Tulaloc has large eyes, jaguar-like tusks and rules the underworld. Tulaloc, the god of the underworld, resides in a place deep underground where the water from heaven and the underworld meet. It is here that Tulaloc regenerates life. It was believed that the underworld, earth and heaven were connected and constantly rotating. Sacrifices of living human hearts were made to provide the sinking sun in the west with enough power to rise again in the east. The Aztec people believed that this abandoned giant pyramid was where the gods created the sun and named it the Pyramid of the Sun. The sun was the center of Aztec worship. People in recent years have started to flock to Teotihuacan on the day of the spring equinox. day when the sun passes right above the pyramid at noon. People hold their hands up and open their palms towards the sun. The ancient people's awe to the power and blessing of the sun is vividly recreated here. So this is how today we, we were able to understand the religious, the significance of religion and how it shaped both the intangible notions of how people conduct their life and the monumental scales of it and how in the city planning level how it has been determined. Thank you very much. <laughs>